you're in, especially when we've got young children, right? I'm sure, I'm sure it's not the most enjoyable thing to do, but you know what? As a good soldier, we volunteer even for tasks that may not appeal to us. They may not be the thing that, they may not be the thing that, hey, this brings me great joy. I'm so excited about this. I'm so happy to be able to do this. No, we volunteer to just be a soldier for Jesus Christ. The, the end, the, the, what he calls us to do is irrelevant. We just, we're just volunteering. Um, we ought to look for opportunities to serve the Lord. Uh, we, we ought to look for different ways. God's army, we must understand God's army is an all-volunteer army. You say, well, pastor, you get paid. Yes, but I still choose to serve the Lord the same way you choose to serve the Lord. We're, we're, we're all volunteers in God's army, but we ought to volunteer. We ought to, we ought to understand that, that God is not pleased when all we do is sit in a church pew. God say, I'm glad that you're here today. But God doesn't want you to just sit there. He wants to use you as a soldier in his army. And every soldier has different tasks. In the military, uh, Brother Brendan, I think he just stepped out, is getting ready to be deployed to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Camp Prince, I believe, right? And, uh, you know, there at Camp Prince, uh, can I tell you, not everyone has the same job. If everyone was comms, they would starve, right? But if, but if everyone was a cook, how would they get the supplies there? There are different jobs, but all of those jobs are important. Can I tell you, whatever your job is in the church, you come to me and you say, Pastor, I want to volunteer to do something. Can I tell you, the thing that you may be asked to do may not be the most glamorous. It may not receive the most recognition, but we don't do what we do for recognition. We do what we do because we're volunteering to serve the Lord. We say, God, I just want to serve you. I just want to do what you want, wherever you want me to serve. So you go to your pastor and you say, hey, Pastor, I, just, I, I want to volunteer for something. What can, what can I do? What can I do to serve? We'll find something for you to do. Can I tell you a secret? There's plenty of things to do. There's, there's a, I got a list. We got plenty of things that you can help with. But we ought to look for opportunities to volunteer. Can I say we should attend boot camp? The right kind of church should feel a little bit about like a spiritual boot camp. Can I tell you, if you're not being challenged, then you're not at the right church. If, the, if you're at a church that just tells you all about Jesus' love all the time and there's never a challenge, you're not being preached the whole counsel of God's word. Can I tell you, there are messages where the love of Jesus is the preeminent theme of the whole message, and that's fantastic. But can I tell you, Jesus doesn't want you. We cheapen Jesus Christ when all we do is say Jesus is love. Jesus is not just love. He's holy. He's righteous. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. We must understand that there are so many more characteristics of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, if we look at Jesus Christ, we can find where Jesus Christ took special exception to certain things throughout his life. Where he was not pleased with the lack of faith. He was not pleased with these different things. And, and sometimes the preacher stands up behind the pulpit and you hear him preach and you think, man, that guy sounds like a, like a drill instructor. That's okay. There should be balance, Right? The, the, I shouldn't be in your face spitting and shouting and doing all that stuff all the time. But you know what? There is a balance. Preaching should challenge us. It shouldn't just make us feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. If it just makes you feel warm and fuzzy, then the, then, then the, then the odds are the Bible is not being preached to the way, the way it should be. Because uh, the, the goal should not be to make you feel good about yourself because the truth of the matter is I know my heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. What is it? It's desperately wicked. I know my heart. So if it makes my heart feel warm and fuzzy, it's probably catering to my emotions, not to the sin nature, or not, not confronting the sin nature that I have in my life. We must understand that, uh, we must remember that the... The, the, the drill sergeant, the pastor, his job is to help prepare you for the battle you're going to go face tomorrow. For the battle you're going to face when you go out and, and you're, you go to the restaurant this afternoon. And you're faced with whatever situation. You're faced with this difficult thing. And, and you, know, you try to apply what you've been trained. You try to apply those teachings. God tell you, uh, church attendance isn't the only place you're trained. I hope you're trained at home. What do I mean? I hope you're in the Word of God. I hope you're in the Bible. 
I can tell you, it's great that your pastor, you, you trust your pastor to help train you and to help teach you principles, but that should not be the, the primary source of your training. It should not be the primary source of your teaching. The Bible should be the primary source. You should be reading your Bible every day. I can tell you, if you come to church and you're here for every service, you'll hear me teach in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. My prayer is that you're in your Bible Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's almost double the amount of time that the Holy Spirit should be working on your heart through the Word of God. And so we ought to, we ought to make sure that, that we, we allow ourselves, we ought to be in church whenever the doors are open. When we have revival, y'all should be here. And praise the Lord, y'all are really good about being here for revivals or anything else that we have going on. Praise the Lord for that. But we ought to make it a point that anytime the church doors are open, we're there. Why? Because we need teaching from God's word. We need the training from God's word. But we also ought to make sure that every morning or every night or wherever you choose to, whenever you choose to read your Bible, once again, I've said this multiple times, I'm an advocate for you reading your Bible in the morning. Uh, it doesn't make sense to put on the armor of God when you go to sleep at night after you've been through the battle all day, right? Well, how do you learn to put on all that armor? Where do, where do you even find what the armor of God is? Ephesians chapter number six. Well, you know how you find Ephesians chapter number six? You open your Bible. You read about it. How do you do that? By reading it. But you don't want to wait until the end of the day to where the, you, you've been attacked by the devil. You haven't had your shield of faith. You haven't had your breastplate of righteousness. You haven't had your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You haven't had your loins girt about in truth. And you know what? Arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow. Why? Because we did not wear our armor. Now, am I saying you're a heathen if you read the Bible in the evening? No, I'd much rather you read your Bible in the evening than not at all. And sometimes things happen throughout the day where you have, you have the greatest plan. And mamas, especially with mamas, you have the greatest plan, right? You're going to wake up at this time and read your Bible. And then all of a sudden your children wake up five times throughout the night. And then your other child is up at 7 a.m. And then uh, it's just, you know, you, you try to do plan A and that doesn't work. You say, okay, I'm going to do nap time today at noon. And then nap time rolls around and all of a sudden none of your kids actually sleep. Uh, then you say, okay, well, I'm going to do it at dinner while they're eating. And then uh, you, you feed them dinner, but then what happens is they're constantly in and out. You're not able to, you're not able to actually spend that time with the Lord. So then the evening rolls around, you put the kids to bed, and you're getting ready for bed, and you think, oh, man, I haven't read my Bible yet. And so you spare a few minutes of sleep to study God's Word. I tell you, if the devil can get you away from Bible reading by making your life busy, rest assured your day will be busy every day. If the devil knows that all he has to do is make things busy for you and you're not going to be in the Word of God, rest assured that's what he's going to do. Wait, why? Because it would make sense as a battle tactic to keep, your, to keep your enemy away from their weapon, right? What is this called? In, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, what is this called? It's called our sword, right? Well, it says it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It's sharp, it cuts, it pierces. The devil, Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says that this is our sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. We must understand that uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we must understand that if the devil can keep us away from our weapon, even if we put on everything else, we're just defending. Right? We're not attacking. But you know what? God's not called us just to be a defender. He gave us a sword for a reason. He gave us a sword to wield it. But yet so many times, because we're not in the Word of God, we don't wield it. Or when it comes time to wield it, have you ever seen, uh, I remember there was a time as a youth pastor, when I was youth pastor in Indiana, I would take all the seniors, uh, we had a big, a big day for all the seniors in our youth group, where I would take them out, we'd go to the shooting range, and we'd blow stuff up, I'd put tannerite and stuff, we'd blow stuff up, or we'd do, you know, just random stuff. And uh, there was one teenager, I, I handed them a rifle, I said, do you, do you I, I, I went through a, like a safety class before he we went shooting, I was teaching them how to use a gun, that kind of thing, but I said, do you know how to aim? And she said, yes, I know how. And so aiming seems to me like it would make a, a lot of sense. But people, people don't know. And so I asked, and she said yes. And I, I stepped right behind her because, you know, safety is important. And uh, she was shooting and, like, hitting the dirt, like, just missing the target completely. And I, I, so I told her to wait a minute. I said, has someone really taught you how to, have you ever been taught to aim? And she said, no. Three minutes, I gave her a quick lesson. And then, tink. Tink, 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 tink. Why? She had a weapon that she was unlearned with. 
She didn't know how to wield it. So even though she welded it, or wielded it, even though it had power, because that gun still has power whether you know how to use it or not, even though it had power, because she didn't know how to use it, it was not being used effectively. With the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, when we do not wield it effectively, uh, it makes it more of a danger to us than it does a help to us. What do I mean by that? We cut ourselves, and many, many false teachers today use one verse out of context to get you to believe a number of lies. When we don't wield it, when we don't spend time in it, that sword can cut us the wrong way. Is it because the Bible's imperfect? No. It's because when imperfect men wield the, wield the Bible the wrong way, they can cause damage to themselves. They can cause detriment. They can cause hurt. The word of God, it's important that we know how to wield it so that when it comes time to use it, we're effective with it. I tell you, armies that are, are well-trained, especially if you look back at the time of, of, of ancient warfare, I'm talking swords and shields, spears, the armies that were veteran armies typically fared better than armies that had never fought before. Why? Because they knew what it was like to swing that sword and have swords swung at them. They knew what it was like for arrows to come in. And I tell you, that's why it's so important that we train up the next generation. Is because you are facing those, many of those battles today. Those arrows are being shot at you. Those swords are being swung at you. The, the spears are being thrown at you. And you're trying to protect your children, which you should. But can I tell you, friend, it's very important that we begin to train our children how to use those weapons before it comes time for them to need to use them. Right? It's important that we teach them how to wield the Bible, how to use the Bible. How, my, my son came up to me this week and said, Dad, I finished the book of Matthew. I read the whole, six years old, finished the whole book of the Bible, only 65 more to go. But he came to me and said, Dad, I finished it. I read the whole thing. And I said, that's great, son. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to teach him to wield it now while Daddy is standing in the way and blocking those fiery darts and doing whatever he has to do. Now, are there still battles my son has to fight? Of course there are. But, I, but as a father, my job is to bear the brunt of that battle, is to bear the brunt of the things while he, while he learns to use his loins girt about with truth, with his feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace, or um, I know what it says, uh, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. I'm training him how to use all of those things. Why? So Because one day he's going to be standing next to me fighting. One day when I'm gone... He's going to be the one fighting for his children. It's important that we teach now. It's important that we attend that spiritual boot camp so they know how, when, and where to use each weapon. Can I tell you, we must know when it's appropriate to use faith. It's important that we know when the breastplate should come into play. It's, it's important that we wear it all together, but each, each serves a different purpose. I'm not going to wield a breastplate the way I wield a shield, Right? We know that, that, that God is often referred to as a shield, but did you know he's often referred to as a buckler? Do you know what the difference in those two things are? A shield is a shield. You know the big thing that you hold on your arm? A buckler is also a shield. But a buckler is not used for defense. They would use it to, it was a, a small circular shield. They would use it to parry, but just as much as it was used to parry, it was used to attack. They would punch with it. They would swing with it. They would do all kinds of things. You see, God is not just our defense, but he's our buckler. He's what we use to parry the blows. He's what we use to attack with. But you know what? If we do not study the Bible, if we do not understand the Bible, if we do not spend time with the tools that God has given us to fight this life, we won't be effective at fighting. We won't be effective in the battle. Every one of you are in a battle today. I can tell you, right now you're in a battle. You know what the devil wants to have happen? You to lose focus today. In service, he, he loves nothing more than when, than when I look out, and this is what I see. He loves that. Why? Because you're not focused. You're not paying attention. You're ignoring you say, I'm not ignoring pastor, I'm here. How easy is it for us to lose focus? I guarantee you, if Brother Bruce stood up to walk out, all of you would look at him. I guarantee it. Why? Because every time it happens, that's what happens. Every time. 
and I'm not faulting you. It's just, it's a, it's a normal thing to do. What's going on, right? I'm not attacking you for that. I'm just saying, but, but the problem is, is the devil tries to use distractions to get you to lose your focus. Uh, sometimes I'll be preaching and a fly will start flying around my head. You know how hard that is to preach with a fly flying around your head? But you know what? If I pay attention to it, then you're going to pay attention to it. And the whole service, instead of listening to what's going on, you're going to be watching this dumb fly fly around the room. You know what the devil's done? Distracted you. We, we, must, we must learn to be, to be focused. We must, we must uh, on purpose decide that when we're in church, we're in church intentionally. It's not just something to do. We're trying to grow. And so we don't, go to, we don't go to church because it's a social gathering. I tell you, I'm glad that we can fellowship one another. I'm glad we can get, to get, get a closer relationship with each other. I'm, I'm glad for those things. I'm happy about those things. But can I tell you, friend, we are not here just for the fellowship. It's one aspect of church. We strengthen each other. But the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, the helping us gain the strength that we need, helping us get the training that we need, that's another reason why we're here. We must be intentional about it. Can I tell you, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, we, we looked at it just a minute ago. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, we must understand that hardness is coming. Do you know that? Difficulty's going to come in your life, right? Trial's going to be there. Hardships are going to be there. And you know what? We must, we must have the proper relationship with God so that we can endure that hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying the thing you're going through isn't hard. I'm not saying the thing that you're going through, I'm not saying I wish it upon you. I'm not saying I'm glad that you're going through it. I'm, I'm not. But what must we do? We must endure. A soldier's life is not a life filled with joy all the time. Brother Brendan, I've looked up some pictures of Camp Prince. It's a tent city. Bunch of tents. Can I tell you, there may be some things that you don't enjoy about living in a tent city. But you know what? You have to endure. Air Force, Air Force tents, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Air Force tents, they're really pop-up buildings. It'll be okay. Uh, no, but uh, no, no, you know, there are things in our life that we don't wish. Brother Brendan, if we take it down to a more real level, you're going to be away from your family for six months. It's hard. Miss Kay, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you. It's going to be hard for your boys. It's going to be hard for Rhea. But you know what? You have to endure. You have to endure. You know, the, the, the physical sense, you have to endure because your husband's in the Air Force. They say he goes, he goes. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. But in the spiritual sense, there's going to be spiritual hardships that you're going to face. Six months of trying to raise your children by yourself. You know you won't be alone. Our church will be here to help you. But there's going to be hardship. We must endure Brother John, your incident yesterday, you have to endure. It's not fun, but you have to endure. Many of you have faced different hardships. Maybe you faced miscarriages. Maybe you faced the death of a loved one. Maybe you faced this, or maybe you faced that. You know what? It's hard, but we, ought, we need to endure. We need to endure even in spite of our hardships. Can I say we ought to learn the soldierly disciplines? To become a good soldier of Jesus, we need to meet the minimum requirements to be in Jesus Christ's forces. Do we have what it takes to become a disciple of Christ? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In that verse, the first thing we see is self-denial. A good soldier must be able to say no to himself. I can tell you, that's the problem with much of Christianity today. And I'm sure many of you can witness and testify, is telling yourself no is hard. But can I let you in on a secret? The judgment of God is harder yet still. The correction from his hand is harder even so. I can tell you, self-denial is not easy. How do I know? Because I love Pepsi. I love Pepsi. And I've been having to tell myself, no, my, my love language, it's not physical touch, it's not words of affirmation, it's not quality time. My love language is Whataburger. My love language is Cheddar's. 
My love language is McAllister's. If it's, if it's food, it's for me. That's what it is. I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it, right? That's my love language, F-O-O-D. But you know what the problem is? My body doesn't need all the F-O-O-D that I eat. As you can see, it doesn't need it all. You know what? So what must happen? I must deny. I want that food from Whataburger, but it's not healthy. I've got a newsflash for you. It's not healthy. It's not healthy to eat that grease-laden burger that's just sopping wet with grease. It's not good for you. It tastes good, but it's not good for you. But that's the way sin is. It looks good. It smells good. It may even taste good. But it's not good for you. We must deny ourselves. We must tell ourselves, no, this is not what I am allowed. This would not please Jesus Christ. When you're tempted, you think to yourself, no, this would not please my commanding officer. This would not please, uh, who is our ultimate commanding officer? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. This would not please my king. And because it would not please my king, I'm going to tell myself no. Many times, Christians, we spend too much time saying what's wrong with it instead of asking the question what's right with it. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. If you have to justify why there's nothing wrong with it, can I make a petition? You probably shouldn't be doing whatever that thing is you're trying to justify. Why? Why? If we have to try to reason why Jesus, if we would not do it free, freely and willingly if Jesus Christ was in the room, you probably shouldn't do it at all. You say, why? You're try, you, 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 there are so many people, so, I'm dealing with a situation right now, not in our church, but somebody who reached out to me for help. They're dealing with someone who uh, is struggling with the thought of modesty. They say, where in the Bible does it say I can't show uh, cleavage? Where in the Bible does it say I can't show my skin? Where in the Bible does... And, and, you know, so many times we get so caught up looking. Uh, I ask the question, where does it say you shouldn't smoke marijuana in the Bible? Well, it doesn't, but there's a lot of principles that would, that would lead me to that belief that Jesus Christ would not be pleased with that. Where does it say I shouldn't do this? Where does it say I shouldn't do that? Where does it say I shouldn't shoot up with heroin? Well, it doesn't say that specifically, directly. You shouldn't shoot up with heroin in the Bible. But there's so many principles that would lead you to that belief. But so many times, Christianity today, we try to justify and reason away why we should be able to do those things. But the reality is that Jesus Christ was standing right next to you. You would never do it to begin with. My petition is, is that if you wouldn't do it if Jesus was there... Why waste time doing it? Why waste the time with it? It's not going to help. It's not going to benefit. It's not going to, to guide us or grow us. Cross-bearing. A good soldier must be willing to bear burdens. He must embrace the hard. The things that are difficult to do, the things that, the things that hurt, the things that you don't want to have to do. Can I tell you, as a father, there are sometimes things that I don't want to do that I have to do. I'm going to tell you, discipline is not enjoyable for me. I think that if you enjoy disciplining your child, we've got a little bit of a, we need to have a little bit of a conversation. We shouldn't find joy in that. Now, the results can bring us joy, but the act of discipline should not bring us joy. It, should not, it shouldn't be something where we, get, we smile about when we administer discipline. That's not right. I, tell you, I cry just as much as my children cry when discipline happens. I don't enjoy it. I don't want it to happen. I don't want to have to do that. But God tells me I have to. God tells me that there's a way that I ought to discipline. There's a way that I ought to do things to help bring about, ultimately, a godly child. I can tell you, I'm not trying to bring around a respectable child. I'm not trying to bring about a good citizen. I'm not trying to bring about a, 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 a someone that obeys. I'm trying to bring around a person that's godly. Can I tell you, if, if my child is godly, my child will be respectable. If my child is godly, my child will be a good citizen. If my child is godly, it'll bring about all those other characteristics that you want. It'll bring about obedience, not because you've made them fear to obey, but they love the Lord enough to obey. We, we, we ought to spend that time Fellowship. A good soldier must be willing to obey orders. 
He must follow his leader. Can I tell you, we lose, I, I, I fear that we lose much of our fellowship with the Lord because we, we're not willing to listen to him. You ever, been in a, you ever been in a conversation before where it feels like every time you try to talk, somebody talks over you? You ever been there before? You say, all the time with you, pastor. No, don't say that. Don't say that. Uh, but, but you've ever been in that conversation before where, where it feels like you cannot, you cannot speak. This person just loves to hear their own voice. You know, there's no fellowship there. Would you agree with that? There's no fellowship. Why? You're, the, you're not communicating. It's just a one-sided, let me tell you all about all the problems I have in my life. But fe- or, or fellowship was not even the word. I, I was confused at what that was supposed to be. But uh, it's an O, not an E. Fellowship. Fellowship. That makes a whole lot more sense now. Fellowship. A good soldier must be willing to obey orders. He must be willing to follow the leader. When, when, we, when we go about our life, our life is not supposed to be what do I want to look like. I'm tired of hearing Christians tell, tell people to explore themselves. Find, find you. Be you. Don't be you. Can I let you a secret? Don't be you. You know what the Bible says? I die daily. I should try to look like Christ, not me. I'll tell you what's in this old boy's heart. Wickedness, sin, unholiness, unrighteousness, violence. All that's within you, Pastor. It's within you too, big boy. Ma'am, it's within you as well. That's why we try to look like Jesus Christ. How is a church unified? A church is unified when the church as a whole says we want to be like Christ. Miss Leah, I know you don't believe this, but we're not the same. I know, it's hard to believe, right? Miss May, we're not the same. Brother June, not the same. We're different. But when we all have a desire to look like Christ, we're not trying to look like each other. We're trying to look like Jesus because we're, what we're following Christ. As we follow Christ, we can work together to accomplish goals because we are not, you're, can I let you in a secret? You're not following me. Yes, I understand that the, 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 the leadership in a church is the pastor, right? But ultimately, the pastor is following Christ. You remember Paul, what did he say? Follow me even as I what? Follow Christ. If I stop following Christ, you should stop following me. You should vote me out of this church quicker than you can say banjo. I don't know. I, I, I couldn't think of any other words. It's the first one that came to mind. But you should, you should vote me out. Get me out of here. If I'm not going to follow Christ. But we should follow authority as our authority follows Christ. We should follow them. We should get behind the things that they're doing. You say, well, I don't understand why pastor's doing that. You know, I, I try to think, and, and some of you, some of you, sometimes, I remember when I first got here, uh, Brother Justin would always tell me, that's enough dreams for today, pastor. That's enough dreams for today. You know what? I'm looking down the road 10, 15, 20 years where I, where I want to see God bring us to. Why? Because where there is no vision, the people perish. Can I tell you, if you, it, you, you, ought to, you ought to think and you ought to be grateful when you have a leader, whether it's your husband, whether it's, whether it's wife, whether it's mother over children, whether it's, uh, whether it's the pastor with, with God's people, whether it's uh, even a president of our country. We ought to be thankful for men uh, 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 that, that are trying to serve the Lord that have a vision. There needs to be a vision. Can I tell you, my vision is for us to outgrow this building, to have to knock this back wall out and extend the auditorium. My vision is to tear down that building out there and have to build a two- or three-story building because we don't have enough room anymore. My desire, my, my vision, my, my, my plan is for growth. I want to see the Lord use us and build us and grow us. And ultimately, I want to see churches started out of our church. I want to see more missionaries supported. I want to see, our, I, I want to see just, just the Lord blow it up in a good way, not in a bad way. I, I want to see the Lord do something great. Can I say, we, but we ought, to, we ought to understand that self-indulgence, weakness, and rebellion are steadily becoming the norm in our society today. But we can be the exception. Can I say, we should also wear the uniform. I've got to be quick. I've got three more pages. I'm not even through page one. We ought to wear the uniform. <laughs> Brother Brendan, I know they just let you wear jeans and a polo or jeans and whatever you want to the base, don't they? No, they don't do that? What do you have to wear? 
your uniform. But so many times, Christians, we get bent out of shape that we can't dress the way we want. We get bent out of shape that, that we can't do the things that we want to do. But God has, you know, you think about it. I was reading, I'm, so I'm reading through the book of Numbers right now. And I just got finished reading through the book of Leviticus. Can I tell you, those are hard books to read. Do you want to know why? Because it's nothing but law and sacrifice. And this person gave this much because God said to do it. And, and chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of God's law. Almost like God's not okay with chaos. It's not your truth. It's God's truth. The way that God wants you to do You know what? We have this argument today, and we're not getting into as far as like the actual dress itself. Okay, We're not talking today about uh, what, what, is, what is appropriate or inappropriate. But there is a certain gender specificity that ought to be true all the time. What do I mean? The Bible is very clear. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. The clear, the clear command from God is that our dress should be distinct. You, you ought to be able to be differentiated. If you're a man, you ought, they ought to be able to tell you're a man. If you're a lady, they ought to be able to tell you're a lady. You know, there are certain characteristics that, that show that forward. There are certain things. Uh, we're, like I said, we're not getting into what, what that is as far as wearing goes or things like that. But what we must understand is that there ought to be a distinction. You see, one of the things that the devil's trying to do today is the devil's trying to erase the distinction between... He's actually trying to flip the genders. What do I mean by that? So we know that at the, at the fall of man, what did God say to Adam and Eve? He told Eve that Adam was in charge. That's what God said. It, uh, ladies, I'm sorry. If you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. That's what God said. God said that. But society is trying to do this. Do you know what that is ultimately? The devil is trying to do this. He's trying to reverse all of those things. Why? Because the devil hates Jesus Christ. He hates God. And he wants, to, he wants to bring in his own thing and his own power. So what is he going to do? For every Christ, or for every Christ, for the Christ, there are many antichrists. The devil brings around many things in many different ways. And make no mistake, the devil has power. So many times I hear these preachers preach like the devil isn't powerful. He is. And he'll kick your can across the street if you're not ready for him. He'll whoop you. He'll give you a black eye. He'll punch you in the nose. He'll, he'll beat the snot out of you. When we yield to him and when we believe what those things are happening, we must always return to the Bible. What does the Bible have to say? What does the Bible say is truth? What does this say? Uh, the, the reality is, is that there ought to be a distinction between the genders. What Christians wear should be unquestionably modest. It doesn't matter. So many times I hear this argument brought up and it's harped on the ladies so hard. Ladies, you ought to be modest. 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 And yes, you should. Men are, uh, men are sight-driven people. Men, look at, you, you, you say, uh, let's, let's be honest, men, look at your bodies. It's not right, and I'm not saying it's right. But when you dress in a provoking way, it entices a man's eyes. I tell you, this is why I've got a problem with, you know how I was talking about that argument? Well, where does it say I can't do all those things? If you're married in the room today, who's, who's your body, whose body is it? Is it yours? You know what the Bible says, Miss Leah, that your body is not yours. It's Brother Paul's. And Brother Paul, your body is not yours. It's Miss Leah's. So if you're flaunting your body, you are, you are stealing from your spouse because it's not your body to give away. It's not your body to show off. That's what God says. I said, just as much, but just as much, you know, we hear this modesty thing preached for ladies so often, but men, it is just as important that you are modest. Can I tell you, you ought not be, you ought not be walking around in your nakedness. You ought not be doing that. You go to the beach, you shouldn't be stripping down into almost nothing going out on the beach. Bless God, ladies, you should be modest, but I'm over here with no clothes on. Come on, that's not a double standard. God's called for modesty on both sides, friends. It's, the, it's not a double standard. Modesty is important for both, for both genders. First, um, 
Ladies, it's important to understand that you are protecting the moral fiber of our nation. Men should be reminded that their bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's important to remember that your bodies are a temple. There's something that should be holy. There's something that should be set apart. But many times, the, the battle that has to be fought is not what is right to wear, but what is modest to wear. I tell you, we, we ought just be modest folks. What does it mean? We shouldn't, we shouldn't be showing off our body. Can I tell you, uh, you shouldn't be wearing tight, form-fitting clothes that accentuate your body. Why? It's just as good as wearing nothing at all. If they leave nothing to thought or nothing to imagination, you've revealed your body whether you've got clothes on or not. We ought, we ought to be modest. We ought to, we ought to, we ought to, we ought to uphold ourselves greater. That's why, uh, that's why we have certain standards as far as what you have to wear for church ministry. Not, not because I'm trying to enforce personal standards, my personal standards upon you, but in church, we ought to be set apart. There, there ought to be some, some set apartness. There, there are standards. There is, a, there is a, a uniform for every job that you work, right? You work at McDonald's, and you know what? You're going to see everybody in the same uniform. You work at McDonald's? Yeah, look at that. You wear a uniform, right? You got your McDonald's shirt, your black pants probably, your black no-slip shoes. Is that right? Sometimes a hat, right? And nobody argues about that. But yet in a church, all of a sudden everything blows up because the pastor just tries to make sure that everybody's able to stay modest. It's a modesty thing. It's not me attacking you. I, I never come to your house and look at what you wear or do those things. I'm trying to just help make sure that we stay modest at our church. Because I'm going to give an account for that one day. Did you know that? That I'm going to have to give an account for this church. The book of Hebrews tells us that. That those that are in authority have to give an account for everybody underneath them. I'm going to have to answer for the conduct of our church. Can I tell you, you, think that, you don't think that that's a burden to bear? That's a burden. Knowing that if I'm here for 40 years, I'm going to give an account for 40 years for all of you. For 40 years. Or however long the Lord lets me. I plan to die here. So if he lets me be 70, that's, what is that? 42 years. 42 years that I'll be here. Praise the Lord for that. But that's a burden to bear. We ought not get upset that there's certain, certain standards of conduct within a church. I'm not trying to govern your personal life. I've never one time been to your house and said anything about the way you carry yourself at your house. Or No, there's just certain conduct, there's certain standards that are withheld within the church. You guys tracking with me? You guys following with me? We must understand that modesty is so important. Why is modesty important? Because from the very beginning of time with sin, modesty has been an issue. How do I know? What happened when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What happened? They realized they were naked, and what did they do? They hid themselves, but what did they make for themselves? An apron of leaves. And when God saw them, was that enough for him? What did he do? He made coats because he said that apron's not good enough. From the very beginning of sin, there's been an issue with modesty. So what pastor's trying to do, pastor is not trying to enforce his personal standards upon you. He's trying to make sure that at the church, we wear the coat. And it may be farther than your standards are. Once again, I'm not forcing, my, I'm not forcing standards on you outside, right? Not even in church, but when you're serving in ministry, right? You can come to church however you are. We're not going to look down upon anybody for that. But to serve in certain areas, there are certain requirements. Why? Because we're supposed to be the example of modesty. We're supposed to be that example. Man, I do not have time to get to the rest of this. Uh, we'll just say this last one, and then we'll get into the rest of the next time. Uh, what, we, what Christians wear should be unquestionably Christian. I'm amazed by the stuff we put on our bodies as far as our shirts go and our, and our clothes go. I tell you, a Christian ought never be caught with a shirt with profanity on it. That's not, I'll let you in on a secret right now. That's not of God. He's against corrupt communication, but we wear shirts that are indecent or that, are, that, that, are, that, that, sh that, uh, that promote lascivious lifestyles or promote nakedness or promote worldly ideologies or promote worldly rock bands or that promote all these other things. We wear all those garments. Those are not Christian. You say there's, there's Christian clothing? We should, we, we should not 
we should not wear things that promote worldly ideologies that promote sin. But yeah, so and to tell you, you should never wear a Budweiser shirt. You shouldn't wear you shouldn't wear a, a, a Smirnoff vodka shirt. You shouldn't wear a mall or mall. I can't even say the word mall Marlboro. You shouldn't be wearing a shirt, shirt advertising for tobacco. You shouldn't be wearing a shirt from a casino. You, you shouldn't be wearing shirts or, or clothing that advertises worldly sinful things. Why? Because we identify with Christ. And if Christ wouldn't want to identify with it, neither would he want you identifying with it. We must understand that our uniform matters. And there are so many more things, and, and we'll get into it next week, I'm sure. But we, we ought to do our best to make sure that our lifestyle, that our, that our actions, that all those things are pleasing to Christ. If you look at the book, Brother Brennan and I were talking about James chapter 2 last night, where it talks about our works. It talks about the things that we do. Understand that that chapter is made for the Christian. You look, it's repeatedly referenced, my brethren. That is not a lost person that's being addressed. That's a Christian that's being addressed. But what is he saying? He's saying that he'll show you his faith by his works. Our works should, should exemplify and should show forth who Jesus Christ is in our life. It should, it should be a clear resemblance. And so I challenge you this week to think about what you do, why you do it, and how you do it. Those three things must all be evaluated in our conduct to make sure that we are well-pleasing to Jesus Christ. Ultimately, at the end of the day, when we're trying to be a good soldier, we're trying to be like Christ. You look, when I just thought about this passage of Scripture. In dealing with the modesty aspect, Peter, when he was fishing on a boat after Jesus had been resurrected, and they realized that Jesus was on the shore, what did Peter do? He jumped into the water. Why did he jump into the water? Because he was naked. He knew that Jesus Christ wouldn't be pleased with that, so he threw himself into the water so he couldn't be seen. But yeah, many times we act like it's no big deal. But to Jesus, our modesty matters. And why we're modest matters. Why we conduct ourselves, why we do certain things. So let me encourage you, when, when we live our life, and, and this was not meant to be a, a message on modesty, but when we, when we live our life, just make sure that, that we're doing what would please Christ, not trying to reason away why what we should do is okay. If God says it, I'm for it. If God's against it, so am I. That should be the methodology to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for this day. Thank you for this time you've allowed us to be together. I pray you be with this uh, next uh, morning service hour, Lord. Lord, we sure love you. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be dismissed for 10 minutes, and then we'll meet back in here for morning service.